have a seat. Go ahead and have a seat. We're going to go ahead and start the mess. I'm just kidding. High five somebody while you have a seat. We got to do something. Rock on. It's, everybody's hot. It's already summertime here. We're all excited for the fall, right? Here we go. Everybody's getting involved. There we go. We got birthday high fives. All right. So as, as we continue in worship here at the Vine Church, that's the one thing we say it every week. Uh, we at the Vine Church are going to be the church that turns the world upside down with the gospel instead of being the church turned upside down by the world. We're going to do it in how we love God and how we love others. And how we do that, we believe that is an act of worship. So many times in our life, we think worship is just music or we think worship is sounding great or think worship is, is just raising our hands. But how we live our life is an act of worship. And we have folks here at the Vine Church that want to just share their act of worship with you. So if it's your first time ever being here at the Vine, or if you're watching online or you ever come hang out with us in the house, we have a special gift for you at the back at our garden area. Uh, when you get here, you'll see it. It's so lavish and lush. There's like a waterfall back there and like all kinds of crazy Awesome, tough crowd. Thanks, but really, we do have things that we have some gifts for you that we would love to give you. But more importantly, we would just like to let you know that if we could serve you or pray for you specifically in any way, we would love to get that information in your hand. Like I said, some folks, this is their act of worship, is walking with you step by step. So if you would like to do that after the service, go hang out with us in the garden. Also, guys, the other way we have acts of worship is some folks love teaching. That is their act of worship. They love fellowship. They love getting together. They love literally just meeting people right where they are, hanging out with them, but also walking through some incredible studies. And this Thursday, we're going to continue a brand new study that we just started this past week. There's still time to catch up if you join our Facebook group. We can get you that information at hello at the vine.tv. But we're going to be continuing our Experiencing God Bible study. We just started unit one. So what ends up happening is we kick it off and then we review it the next week. So if you would like to be a part of experiencing God and what this study is about is literally hearing God's voice clearly and learning about growing our faith. And what better way to do that than coming and hanging out with folks, having some great food, having some good times. You will have some homework, so I'm sorry if you don't like homework, but I promise you, it will be worth it. So if you would like to come hang out with us on Thursday nights and prepare and be in that act of worship as folks uh, love serving you, come hang out with us there. And last but not least, here at the Vine Church, we believe giving is an act of worship. Uh, we are generous in how we give. We believe that God has blessed us to be a blessing. It's not about how much we keep. It's not about how much money is in the bank. It's about what he's calling us to do with it. And throughout us being here at the Vine Church, each and every week, I want you to know that, that we give to the community. We, we're, we're not afraid to be out in the community. We love to give to churches around the world, to gospel-centered nonprofits around the world. And this past week, we collected an offering and celebrated an offering with the Carolina Pregnancy Center. And guys, I was just so excited to see the number that God let us give. But the thing is, it wasn't about the number. It was more about the people that were involved. We know that people are out there meeting women when they're in their most difficult decision ever and probably the most trying time of their life and most confusing time of their life and willing to walk with them step by step. So if you want to be a part of making a difference in this community, if you want to be a part of an act of worship by giving, I'm not going to talk to you about a number. I'm not going to talk to you about a percentage because that's not what it's about. It's about our heart being right. So if you would like to be a part of that, you can give after the service in our tithe box in the back, or you can go to the vine.tv slash give, and we would love to worship with you by giving. I'm about to pray, and when I get through praying, if you'll stand up, and we're going to continue in our worship. So dear Jesus, thank you for this time. Thank you for allowing us to be here today uh, to lift your name high. Lord, uh, it's not about us. Uh, each and every person, Jesus, from the beginning, from the moment the sun came up this morning, there were people here that were in acts of worship. They were setting this church up. After we get done today, folks are going to tear this church down, but it's not because of we want our name to be in fame, that we want anything for us. It's because we want to point others to you. So, Jesus, as we continue walking in worship today, I pray that we would just see you in a new way. We would point others to you in a new way. And today, if you've called us to take a next step, I pray that we would boldly take it because we know, we know that if you've called us to it, it's for your glory and for our good. Be with us as we continue worship, Lord. We love you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. You guys stand up and sing with us. Who breaks the power of sin and darkness? Whose love is mighty and so much stronger 
the king of glory, the king above all kings.
Jesus, you're my hope and stay. today that we need you. We cannot go through a single day without your without your grace, without your blessing. God, we just thank you so much for everything that you've done for us. Lord, I pray that you give Charlie some words to say today. He speaks through you.
All right, here we go. Try this again. Now, high five somebody. Let them know you're happy that they're here today. Yes, if you were watching online, you can see what I love about what we do is we can roll with the punches here for Ryan. It's always good. There's never a dull day. And believe it or not, uh, I should have just kept talking like I was in the microphone. Like I said, for those watching online around the world, you could have uh, just said, I want to believe I can hear, but. Uh, so there we go. Ooh, there we go. Came in at the wrong time. That was good. That was good. So over these past few weeks, we've been unpacking this series where we, 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 we say, I want to believe, but, because we've all been there. Maybe we're in a season of that right now. Maybe, maybe we're not in a season of that right now. We just came out of a season of that. Or maybe we're about to go into a season of that where we say, I want to believe God, but I don't see him. I want to believe God, but he's not answering my prayers. I want to believe God, but I just can't feel his presence right now. Has anybody ever been there? Is anybody there right now? Hands flying up across the room. You're in good company if you have been, because here's the thing, we've all been there. So I want to tell you today, sometimes growing up in church, we learn to feel guilty about that and feel shameful about that, didn't we? Because we it, obviously we're not a good Christian if we didn't hear from God, right? Obviously if we're, we're praying and we're not seeing God move, we're not a good Christian. And here's the thing I want to tell you today, that has nothing to do with it. We are here together to walk through this together. And I'm so thankful that Jesus has us doing this. So if you've got your Bible today, the story we're going to be walking through today uh, is Daniel 6. And then we're going to be hanging out with the letter that Paul wrote to the church in Philippi. So uh, if you've got your Bible today, go ahead. You're going to be in two places. If you're kind of like me and you like having a, you can see I do things digitally. I also do things in the hardcover here. As that goes, I do things hardcover here. So if you've got your Bible, go ahead and get to Daniel 6 and get to Philippians 1, but also, maybe you like to do things digitally, and so every week we partner with the Bible app so that you can follow along with us. So if that's you right now, I'm going to show you how you can do that. Maybe this is your hundredth time hearing it. Actually, I know it's not quite there yet, but anyway, maybe it's your hundredth time hearing it or your first time. Here's how you can do that. Go ahead and download the Bible app from your favorite app store, and once you do that, you're going to open that up, click on the more tab, not the city, but the tab. After you do that, click on events, and you're going to see the Vine TV worship experience. Today, you're going to see this message title that's called Stand Strong. And in that, what you do is you open that up, and you're not only going to find the scripture we're going to walk through today, but you're going to find our information, our contact information. If there's any way that we can serve you or specifically pray for you, uh, we would love to do that. Like I said in the beginning, uh, a little bit earlier today, we believe that every gift God has given us, we give back to him as an act of worship. And so we have folks that pray with people that they don't even know throughout the week. We have people that meet brand new people throughout the week. We have people that pray over tithes and offerings. We have people that pray over this house every week. And they just want to walk and do life with you. So if that's you, reach out to us throughout the week if there's any way we can serve you. So uh, if you've got your Bible, go ahead and get to Daniel 6. And if you grew up in church, you've heard this story. But I want to set it up this way. Do you ever feel like somebody's just watching you? You ever feel like you're standing on stage trying to find a microphone and everyone is just watching, watching you? No, really. You ever feel like somebody's watching you? Like so many times I feel like somebody's watching me and I'm not talking about like the Halloween song where I always feel like, like, I, no, 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 not that, not that, not that, not that. Uh, but you feel like somebody's watching me and I don't know about you, but in this world that we live in, sometimes when I feel like somebody's watching me, I feel like I'm in the middle of a bunch of cannibals, Right? And like they're all looking at me, but yet I see one who's like looking at me real good, checking me out, you know, going up and down, head, toe, and eyeballing me. And I'm thinking, that's the one that wants to fight me, right? Like I'm ready to go. And I look at him and I say, what are you looking at? And he says, I'm the food inspector. And so, so many times in my life, that's what I feel like is people are eyeballing me and people want to consume me. And here's the thing that I want to know. And here's the thing I want you to know. Sometimes as Christians, don't we feel that way? Like we're in the middle of a bunch of cannibals who are just trying to devour us. I want you to know as a Christian, you are being watched. And in this world that we live in more than ever, in this world about tolerance that we live in more than ever, when you say you're a Christian, some crazy things come to mind. Some really crazy things come to mind. As a matter of fact, some of the things that come to mind is when you say you're a Christian, a lot of times people think you're bigot. People think you're a racist. People think that you're myopic. People think that you're short-sighted. People think, I want to believe, but, and they go back to that text that they sent their Christian friend back in the day where they said, I want to believe, but there's no way God is here. There's no way God's alive. There's no way God is with me. 
And so what I want you to know today, as we walk through this message called, I want to believe but stand strong, is that there is hope. Because the thing that Jesus has just been teaching me and been reminding me through all of this is this. As we go through standing strong and we talk about, I want to believe but stand strong, the world is watching. But it's not my playground. It's actually a battleground. And we as Christians have to understand that the world is a battleground. Yes, there are some amazing things that happen at church. There are some amazing things that we can do to be a part of church. And there are some things that we get to do in this world that are awesome. But what I want you to know is as a Christian, we live in a battleground. This isn't our final destination. This isn't the place where we're going to camp out for eternity. We have somewhere greater to go. And our whole mission on this earth is to point others to him all the way through. And so, Christians in the room, today I'm speaking specifically to you, Christian. Hey, uh, I'm speaking specifically to Christians in the room. Are we going to let the world devour us? Are we going to point people to our hope no matter what comes our way? Because if we see that the world is a battleground and not a playground, we're going to see that we are able to stand strong. So today, that's what I want to talk to us about. Three ways to stand strong. And we're going to be kind of paralleling some scripture. So hang in here with me. We're going to be in Daniel 6 with a story that we're familiar with. And then we're going to be in Philippians 1. And we're going to be talking through both of them kind of at the same time. So hang in here with me as we walk through this, okay? So maybe you didn't grow up in church. So I don't want to assume that you know this story, but you might have heard of it. So what ends up happening is this guy named Daniel, we've talked about him before. This guy named Daniel in his 20s uh, goes into exile as a slave. Uh, And what ends up happening uh, is he goes to Babylon with Israel as they're going into captivity. uh, And he decides that the food's not kosher, so him and his friends aren't going to eat the food. So in other words, they only eat vegetables at the time. And we've heard of his friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, right? And they go through this fiery furnace, and it's because they didn't bow down to the king at the time. Well, that's the first king Daniel served under. Then the second king Daniel served under, we're coming on the back end of that, is he goes to this king and has a dream... And he's got the guts, he's got the gumption, he's got the cojones to go up to this king and say, hey, your reign's about to come to an end. The dream that you had, I'm interpreting it for you, and God has told me to tell you your reign is about to come to an end. How would you feel about having to do that? Isn't that great, having to walk up to somebody and be like, oh yeah, by the way, king, you can kill me if you want to, but your reign's going to come to an end. Doesn't end well, right? Like that's, that's what is it, Game of Thrones that everyone watches now? I, I'm sorry, I'm sorry probably one of the only people in the world who hasn't yet, uh, and I would probably dive too deep in, that's why I haven't yet. So if you watch that, maybe that's what it is. How crazy would that be? Would you last long if you had to tell that to a king, right? So that's what just happens, and, and Daniel's just coming off of that, and that king's name was Belshazzar, and he was the king of the Babylons, and this new king takes over. His name is King Darius, and, and he is called the king of the Medes. And so where we pick up in Daniel 6, verse 3, is right after that. So if you're clicking with me, Daniel's already stood strong twice. He's going to have to stand strong again, and here we go. So it says this in verse 3, and, and just highlight some things that point out. I want to give you the freedom to write in your Bible. Don't be afraid to do that. Highlight what sticks out at you, and we're going to walk through this. So it says, now Daniel so distinguished himself among the administrators and the satraps by his exceptional qualities that the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom. So this guy, King Darius, is like a master at administration. How he set up his kingdom is he had three people who served under him, who had 120 people serve under them, so that way the kingdom could not overtake him. So he tried to have some buffers in between him and a revolt happening, right? So what ends up happening is Daniel is among those three to lead over the kingdom, And because he's so great at what he does, the king wants to set him over the entire kingdom. He's a slave. He wants to set over the entire kingdom. How crazy is that? How awesome is that? At this time, the administrators and the satraps tried to find grounds for charges against Daniel and his conduct of government affairs. But they were unable to do so. They could find no corruption in him because he was trustworthy and neither corrupt nor negligent. Finally, these men said, we will never find any basis for charges against this man, Daniel, unless it has something to do with the law of his God. How does Daniel sound? Incredible, right? Like this guy who should be nothing is is getting ready to stand strong again. And they say, all these leaders, he's just trying to follow Jesus. And believe it or not, 
he's in government. Bless his heart. Uh, so, like, he is in government, and he is he is in, 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 in the public eye, and he's just trying to follow Jesus and be obedient to what he's trying to do. And I want you to know, Christian, as you stand up for God and you just try to be obedient to what God's calling you to do, there's going to be somebody that's out to get you. I want you to know that. And I don't mean that to make you on the defensive. I don't mean that to make you want to fight people and not grow in relationships and not have people with you. I just want you to know the enemy scheme to try to take you down. This one guy named Daniel who had no authority to be where he was, who shouldn't have even been where he was, now all of a sudden is, is, is trying to, the king wants to make him over the entire kingdom. So today I want to share with you those three ways to stand strong. The first way today that you are trying to stand strong is this, if you want to stand strong in your walk with Christ, consistency. Consistency. If you really want to stand strong in Jesus, the number one tool to fight Satan, the number one tool to fight anyone who goes against you is a consistent godly character, or you could say a godly consistent character. If you want to fight the enemy, have consistency. What Daniel had is nothing was found against him. There was no corruption in him. He was trustworthy, and he was not negligent. In other words, he had great character. Now, in the world we live in today, it's really hard to have great character, isn't it? Because the first thing that gets assassinated in this social media-driven world is your character. In this tolerant world is your character. And so, so what's really crazy is in a tolerant world where we should be accepting each other more than anything, we actually have divisions more than anything. And the enemy loves that. Satan loves that. That's exactly what he wants us to be. And so when he's doing this, he's scheming against Daniel to try to take over, uh, to try to take over what God wants to do in Daniel. And, and, and as I'm getting ready for this, this is going to be something today that I just want to share with you. There's going to be hope at the end, and it might be something that smacks you in the face a little bit, but it's something Jesus has been smacking me in the face with. When folks become new Christians, we don't talk to them about this, do we? We want to let them know that there's going to be no opposition coming from you. Everything's great, everything's good, and everything's going to be taken care of. Life is smooth sailing after you become a Christian. And I'm here to stand to tell you today as a Christian that you couldn't be further from the truth. And I'm sorry that people lie to you that way and say that. Your hope will always be consistent. And you will have hope no matter what your circumstance is when you give your life to Jesus Christ. But that doesn't mean that your life is going to be easy. It doesn't mean that it's going to be smooth sailing. As a matter of fact, because you're a Christian, Jesus said and promised us in this world there would be tribulation for his name's sake. Like, we will suffer for him. We will have to go literally die. That When the church was born, they were dying for him. And so, so what happens to us so many times in our life is the best advice I can give a new Christian, the best advice I could give you if you've just given your life to Jesus is live a life of consistency. And I promise you, it'll pay off. It'll pay off. I can't promise you that where you are when you give your life to Christ today, that addiction you struggle with is going to be gone tomorrow. I can't promise you that if you've made bad financial decisions, if you give your life to Christ today, that the debt's going to be wiped away tomorrow. But I can promise you that Jesus will walk with you through it, and you can get through it, but you just got to be consistent. You got to take one baby step at a time. You got to put one foot in front of the other. And so that's where Daniel is here. Is he's gone through all these things with God. He's, he's gone into slavery. He saw his friends supposed to be murdered and burned alive, and yet somehow they got through. And now all of a sudden, he has an opportunity to have extreme influence. And these guys are coming against him. But they can't find anything wrong with him. Why? Because he's consistent. And so when I was getting ready and prepared for this message, I said, well, you know, sometimes we can look at this story and we remember the old flannel graph of Daniel in the lion's den back when we grew up in children's church days. If you know, you know. If not, I'm sorry. You missed out on a great part of life. I'm just telling you, flannel graph is great. Uh, What happens with Daniel is so many times we learn that and we think, oh, that's Old Testament times. That doesn't happen to us today. Well, I went to this guy named Paul in the New Testament. So Paul at this time is writing to the church in Philippi. And what's happening in Philippi is it's supposed to be known as the church of love and it's supposed to be known as the place of love. And what ends up happening in this time is if you say you're Christian, you could die. You could literally die. What Daniel's about to walk through, you literally could be thrown in prison and killed. And so Paul starts off his letter in in, in Philippians 1 talking about the saints. He starts off saying, you are saints because you've given your life to Jesus. So he starts off by saying they're saints. And then he says, because you've given your life to Jesus and you are saints and now you are children of God, you're called to a life of service. That's how you worship. You, You have 
You give a life of service to serve those around you that Jesus has placed around you, and you are called to serve them. So he goes from saints to service to being servants, and then he changes his tone where we're going to pick up. He says, hey, you're saints of the Most High God. You were called to serve those around you. But here's the last thing I want you to understand as he's writing this church in Philippi. You are soldiers. And here's where we pick up. He shifts his tone to soldiers. Philippians 1 verse 27 says it this way. Whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then whether I come and see you or only hear about you in my absence, I know that you will stand firm in one spirit striving together as one for the faith of the gospel. So what Paul's writing at this time is we can get stuck. Uh, we can get stuck, and, and the words that we hear now, uh, we can get stuck and, and, and miss the whole meaning of where Paul was. Well, when Paul wrote this letter, we know the time frame of Philippi, like I was sharing, but now I want to tell you about the words that are happening in Philippians 1. If you look at that, it says, whatever happens. That means whatever happens. How hard is that? Whatever happens. Good, bad, or indifferent, whatever happens, conduct yourselves. So the Greek word for conduct is polititumai. So hang in here with me. You can look that up in the Strong's Concordance later. But polititumai, it's where we get the word police today. Not sting in the mouth. Police or politic or policy. Now, how many things got in your head? Was that positive imagery when I said that? How many things got in your head? But you see, we can miss the point. Believe it or not, Christians, that's the things that people think about us right now is they have some negative things in our head, right? So in this Greek word that's called pol polytomai, what it comes for, from is a Greek province called polis or polis, P-O-L-I-S. And what those people did is they lived, as they called them, you, you had to have this polytomai because you were a good citizen. What that means is you represented the best of the city in which you lived. So conduct yourself. So whatever happens, live the best you can, be the best citizen you can of the city you represent. So Christians, I'm not talking about representing Spartanburg well. I'm talking about representing heaven well. No matter what circumstance we walk through, we're called to conduct ourselves in a manner worthy. In a manner worthy. Worthy literally means to balance the scales. Balance the scales. This means that when we say somebody's worthy of honor, somebody's worthy of what's happening to them, somebody's worthy of the accolades that they receive, it's because the award that they're receiving is balanced out by their good character and actions that happen. When we say that, worthy, we balance the scale. So in other words, our character should match the accolades that we give. Our character should match our conduct. When we say that we want to live as good citizens, we should act, actually live as good citizens. I've heard it said this way, and it makes me, and it makes me think, and where Jesus works in me and, and tries to press in me is this. You know, anyone can be a saint abroad, especially in this world where social media is our megaphone. You can tweet the right thing. You can put all the Bible verses out there. You can say all the right things, but you can be a devil at home. Nobody will know. And what Jesus is saying is, the way we conduct ourselves that's worthy of the manner of Jesus Christ is, is the way we're at home the way that everybody else sees us in the world? Because if we really want to make a difference in the world of people around us, we've got to conduct ourselves. We've got to live as good citizens representing the best of heaven and balance the scales of worthiness by showing people, hey, Jesus is who he says he is. I can tell you because of what he's done in my life. And I will be the first to tell you I'm not perfect. I don't have it all together. I wish I could tell you Daniel 6.3 described me to a T, but it doesn't. Nowhere near does it describe me to where I need to be. But I'll tell you, Jesus is working with me through it. And that's what we get to share with others. As a matter of fact, there's a story that goes this way. All right, pastor story. Heard this in church, so hang in here with me. In 1986, an IRS tax auditor, veteran of 25 years, got arrested. What do you think he got arrested for? Tax evasion. He got arrested for tax evasion. Why? So the guy who audited people put him in jail, took all their possessions, gave them penalties and fines. After 25 years, got put in jail for tax evasion. Why? Because he found a loophole in the system, or so he thought he found a loophole in the system. But what ended up happening is the system found a loophole in his character. And because his character was flawed, and because he wasn't living his life worthy of the manner of conducting himself the way that he should live, he actually got caught and fined out, and he went to prison. 
So the thing is, in our life, I want you to know, if we stand up and act like we're perfect, we stand up and act like we have it all together, it's going to come crashing down, guys. It is. Because Jesus promised in this world we will face opposition, but we've got to stand strong by being consistent. Consistent in our character. Consistently saying, hey, I'm not where I want to be, but by God's grace, I'm not where I used to be. Consistently. And here's how I'm consistently growing in Christ. This is how I'm consistently taking next steps. That's why we're doing this Experiencing God Bible study on Thursday nights at our greenhouse. We're doing this Experiencing God Bible study. So uh, that being said, where we are is uh, I want us to know that a consistent life is something Jesus has called us to live. And the last thing about this before I move on, stand firm, stand firm. Stand firm is what Paul says. If you look at the end of that, Philippians 1, it says, after we've conducted ourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ, we're called to stand firm. Now, we're going to talk about what it means to be in one spirit next week, striving together, because we're going to talk about standing with next year, next week and how we can be unified. But stand firm. So if you're taking notes and you would like to, I'm going to spell this out. The Greek word for stand firm is stakate, which is S-T-E-K-E-T-E. Stakate. This is how you know that Paul has switched from this saint-servant talk to soldier talk. What that word means is to stand your post. Never leave your guard. You're always supposed to be standing firm in one, one spirit. So in other words... It's not saying, will the opposition come? It's that the opposition's coming. Have you ever, have you ever just watched on television? Maybe you're not into sports. So I, had, I, I will give you the sports analogy of football, but let me, let me put it to you this way. Have you ever just watched a television show and you hear the crowd coming closer and closer to someone and they're getting ready to battle? Have you noticed how they're relaxed and all of a sudden their stance changes? Like, you know, they're, they're st- I'm not going to do the Elvis kick. Don't y'all get excited because I'll probably rip my jeans. But, like, have you ever noticed that their stance changes? Usually they get real broad. Their shoulders are good. They're giving less of a target for someone to hit. They're standing strong. Now, how many people would want to stay with this person that's standing strong? A lot of people probably would. How many people would want to be with the one that ran away from the mob and ran away from the opposition, right? Jesus didn't call us to run from it. He called us to stand strong in it. And how much greater are we when we're unified together because we're standing strong? So, in other words, the opposition will come. So, so many times in our life, in our Christian life, and in the social media world we live in, we want an angry tweet, we want an angry comment, we want, to, we want to get things, and we think, well, I just deleted the tweet, so I'm good to go, and I want to tell you, you're just assassinating your character. we got to live a consistent life, guys. Consistency. If we want to stand strong, we got to live consistent. we gotta, we got we to gotta represent the best of heaven. we got to practice what we preach. And as we do it, we will stand strong. We will have great balance as the opposition comes. We'll brace for impact. How much greater can we do it when we lock arms together and brace for impact? It's crazy what happens when we do that. So moving on back to Daniel as we're learning these three things. If we go back to Daniel 6, as some of you hear the big flop as you turn your Bible over back to Daniel 6. I'm thankful I have those two markers in my Bible. Daniel 6, if you don't know the story, once again, what ends up happening is these satraps, these two guys that are jealous of Daniel, go to King Darius and say, oh, great King Darius. You know, they have their big decree and they get excited. They probably throw this big ball. Uh, They get excited and say, you're the greatest king. And you know what? Because you're the greatest king, here's what we are going to ask you to do. Over the next 30 days... We want you to issue a decree out to everyone that says they can't bow to any other God or any other man but you. Now, you see, Daniel's been here before. Daniel was there with his friends as they went to the fiery furnace. So this isn't going to be a new decree to him. This isn't going to be something that he's not expecting. But to those guys who were scheming against him, all of a sudden they're telling him, hey, this is how we're going to get him. We're going to attack his religion. Sound familiar in the world you live in if you're a Christian? We're going to attack what he believes. And so this decree gets issued, and Daniel 6.10 picks it up, and it says, Now when Daniel learned that the decree had been published, he went home, shut all of his doors, took blackout curtains, put those up, hid all of his religious gear, he, he hid his prayer mat, he, 
Oh, that's not what it says. My bad. It says, when Daniel learned the decree had been published, he went home to his upstairs room where the windows were open. This is what I love about it. He didn't shut his windows. His windows were open so everyone could see it. And three times a day, he got down on his knees and he prayed, giving thanks to God just as he had done before. Not only was he consistent, he was brave. So if you want to stand firm, you want to stand strong today, you've got to live a life of consistency, and you've got to live a life of bravery. He wasn't afraid to stand there. He wasn't afraid to stand up. He wasn't a battle-shy believer. And so what I struggle with so many times in my life, and maybe you do too, if so, we can be friends because we're going to learn through this together, is so many times in our life, my first, my first reaction to standing strong is to get in the stands. I'm ready. I'm going to take them. I'm ready to go. When in reality, I'm not. My first stance should be to get on my knees. Because if I can kneel down before God, I can stand up before any man. And so many times in our life where we struggle is we forget the need to pray. Daniel wasn't afraid to pray. He said, hey, I know I've been through this before. God, I've seen you deliver my friends. I've seen you deliver me. And the first thing I need to do is pray. When this decree comes about, I need to pray. Here's what I'm getting at in today's world. There are some laws being passed in today's world that everybody's got an opinion about. It's not the laws that need to change us. We have a chance to rise up as the church, conduct ourselves worthy of a manner of the gospel, be consistent in what we do. We can be brave and say, this is why I believe what I believe. And I'm going to meet you right where you are. It's not about changing the laws. We think that's new. This isn't new to Daniel. So he gets on his knees and he prays. But the thing that I love is he didn't start a hashtag campaign. He didn't organize a march. He didn't do any of those things. He just prayed. He believed in the power of prayer. And he said, God, what would you have me do? If you've been doing experience with God, you'll know. You'll, you'll enjoy that when you get there. God, what would you have me do? Show me the way. That's all he did. He prayed. And so to us, we think that this knew the world we live in, but guys, it's always been there. We can learn. We can learn from the past, but also we can see where God's moving going in the future. And so that being said, we can even look back and see what Paul says about this in Philippians 1. Philippians 1, remember we just, we just finished up verse 27 where we talked about conducting ourselves worthy of a manner uh, excuse me, conduct ourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ, and we were called to stand firm. Now, what's the next thing that Paul says? Without being frightened. Without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you. This is a sign to them that they will be destroyed, but that you will be saved, and that by God. You ever live your life in fear? Guilty. I'm not afraid to say there are times in my life when I live in fear. But you know what fear does? Doesn't it just control you? Don't you feel like it manipulates you? I've been in relationships that are, that are led by fear. And it gets, it gets compliance. But it definitely doesn't get a grow relationship at all. It gets compliance, but it doesn't have a deep level rooted relationship. Something that can bear the fruits of the gospel. It doesn't have anything that can just grow and be out there. And so many times in our life, we're fearful, and Paul knows this to the church in Philippi. Daniel knew that when he got on his knees to pray. And Paul's encouraging them by saying, after you've stood strong as a soldier of Jesus Christ, don't be afraid, because there's something we need to see. What if the opposition that's coming against us is the confirmation of God moving through us? What if all of that opposition that we're facing is actually a confirmation from God that we're on the right track, that we're going where he's created us to be? Because here's the thing, through that opposition, we learn so much about ourselves, don't we? I know in my life, when I've faced opposition, it's pointed out the fear that I have in my life. When I've faced opposition, when I've faced obstacles that seemed insurmountable, surgery a few weeks ago that I didn't want to have, that I didn't want to walk through, I had to walk through it. And that may not seem like much to you, but it was to me. It was a big deal. I was like, holy cannoli, like, I'm going to be out for the count. Like, this is crazy. But yet, going through that, Jesus has shown me where my pride was greater than my faith, where my fear was greater than my faith. 
And so when you face opposition in your life, when you face folks that are trying to assassinate your character, that are trying to assassinate what you believe, what if Jesus is just confirming in you you're exactly where you're called to be? See, Daniel wasn't afraid to run. Paul's telling the church in Philippi, don't be afraid to run. And Paul's in prison. He's telling them, don't be afraid to run. He's telling them, hey, these things are going to happen, but it's just confirmation from God. Will you just trust that? So today, if you're trying to stand strong, I wonder if you would see that this opposition that's coming against you is actually going to get you closer to being exactly who God created you to be. Because so many times when I have that opposition, I want to shrink down, get in that fetal position, <laughs> cry like they say, you know, I just want to shrink down. That's not what we're called to do. We're not called to shrink down. We're not called to be a battle shy believer. As a matter of fact, we're called to stand strong and be brave. There's a story that goes in 2000, or excuse me, 2000, whew, in 400 AD, there was a Syrian monk named Telemachus. And I'm sharing this because the lie I used to tell myself is there's no way one man can make a difference. Like I know Jesus can make a difference, but he's, he's Father, Son, Holy Spirit. There's no way that one person can make a huge difference. So this guy named Telemachus, he's a Syrian monk, and he's in the middle of the gladiator games. The middle of these gladiator games, he's going to Rome, he sees the games, and all of a sudden, he runs to the arena floor, and he says, in Jesus Christ's name, forbear. That's your King James Version. In other words, he's saying, stop, in the name of Jesus, stop, this is pointless. You're killing each other just to kill each other. There's no point in bloodshed happening. And so because he went onto the arena floor, the, de the penalty for that was death. Now, some say he was killed by the sword by the gladiator. Some say that the, stone, the, the, crowd, the crowd stoned him. I, I don't quite know what happened, but we do know that day Telemachus died on the arena floor and his blood was spilled. And you would say, how pointless. Like, what difference did he make? Why would he not be outside organizing a crowd and, and starting up something and standing out front telling people how stupid this was? Instead, he ran onto the battlefield. He literally ran to the battlefield and said, stop doing this because that's what God had called him to do within less than four years there was no more gladiator games in Rome at all if it happened in 400 AD as a matter of fact then on 401 AD there was no gladiator games in Rome some say this happened around 397 some say around 391 okay so what happened in this time is I'm going off of the 397 time frame one man stood up to make a difference one man says I'm angry enough that I can't live this way anymore. The world can't be this way anymore. We have to do something about this. And because of that, he made a difference. He was brave. He stood strong. And so I wonder if we understand all the way through that we've got to be brave. Even in the midst of intense opposition, we've got to be brave. And I don't mean brave like butthole brave, like mad, angry, curmudgeon brave. I mean brave like saying, I don't care what my coworkers think about me for walking with you. As a matter of fact, I don't care if they agree with what I'm doing. This is what Jesus has called me to do. We've got to stand strong. We've got to stand strong. Church is the beauty of what we're called to do. So now if you've got your Bible, let's hear those pages turning and flip back to Daniel. You enjoy the Bible app like never before. If you're not a Bible turner or page turner right now, you enjoy that. We're going back to Daniel 6 and seeing how Daniel decided after his life of consistency to be brave by prayer. Now all of a sudden what ends up happening is if you know what happens is obviously Daniel gets caught. I mean, he's literally praying out loud. He might as well have had like this big bell tolling every time he prayed. And might as well have just said, hey, everybody, join me for prayer this afternoon. Like, he might have just had, like, that veggie tail kind of thing, like, right, ready to go at this moment in time. Let's all pray at the same time. And so he gets caught. Those two guys scheme, and they, they remind the king. The king is saying, man, I shouldn't do this. And they remind the king, hey, when you sign something in law, big guy, it's got to happen. Or else the whole nation's going to revolt against you, so you might as well do it. And so what ends up happening is Daniel gets the penalty for that, which is to be thrown into the lion's den. Talk about a bunch of cannibals. He's thrown into the lion's den at this moment in time. 
But you see, the one thing I don't see about Daniel is I don't see his, his opposition. I don't see his scheming to get out of the lion's den. I don't see him talking about, let's bear arms and go together and go fight the king so I don't have to die. But what ends up happening is here in verse 16, it says, So the king gave the order, and they brought Daniel and threw him into the lion's den. The king said to Daniel, May your God, whom you serve, continually rescue you. A stone was brought, was placed over the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his ring, with his own signet ring, and the rings of his nobles. This is the thing that can get us so many times, and I can tell you, it wasn't something that Jesus had to work out through me in my walk with him. They did that so that Daniel's situation in life would not deteriorate. Would you still follow Jesus if you knew your situation was better? Because I don't follow Jesus because my situation has changed. I follow Jesus because it's changing my eternity. It's giving me hope and peace regardless of my situation. But so many times in our walk, we don't preach that. We don't talk about that. I'm not trying to talk doom and gloom. Hear me out, hear me out. I have to have hope no matter what happens because I have Jesus and I know that he has already, he knew me in the womb. He formed me in the womb. He knew I was going to walk through this when I was going to walk through it. It's just do I trust him in it? So after I've lived a life of consistency, I've lived a life of bravery, I've got to understand to stand strong i got to go through some agony. And that's hard. Because nobody wants agony for anybody, do we? Like as a parent, I, I'm not a parent. That's why the world's still turning. <laughs> I'm not a parent. But as a parent, you don't want your children to go through pain. And our Father in Heaven really doesn't want us to go through pain, but He knows that through the suffering, there's a process in which we get to learn to grow closer to Him. Daniel's about to step into immense suffering. I don't know about you, but going into the lion's den, I definitely would have peed myself or uh, tried to figure out a way. I would have tried to pet the kitties, you know, <laughs> love the kitty and like tried to do something with the cat. Did some things to occupy them. I would have probably been like, it's only a night. And then when they put the rock over it, it was pitch black. So think about that. I could smell the lions. I could hear the lions. I felt the tail hitting me. Like, you know, something's happening. Something's going like, I would have been so scared. I would have been so scared. And yet Daniel just goes straight in. No questions asked. To have that faith. To have that faith. You know, I wish, I wish as we're about to go to Philippians to see what Paul, how he finishes his letter to be a strong soldier. I wish the health and wealth prosperity gospel folks would share this part with you. Because the thing is, yes, giving your life to Jesus is the most important decision you'll ever make on the face of this earth. It's after that when we give this false promise that all these great things are going to happen. If it's God's will, it will. But I promise you, you're going to face opposition. You're going to have times in your life where you're having to ask Jesus to show you the way because you just don't know it. You can't make a plan for it. You know, nothing, nothing I, I never planned to have surgery. It wasn't in my regularly scheduled life. I didn't look one day and say, hey, when I'm 35, this is going to happen right at Easter. Like, I never planned that. That's why I love what we do with the Carolina Pregnancy Center. There are people who walk in and say, I didn't plan this. And somebody says, hey, I'm going to walk with you through this. It's okay. And I promise you it's probably not easy. It may seem like suffering, but I promise you it's for a reward. And so what happens is so many times in our life what we have to talk to each other about that I wish was talked to me more about when I was a baby Christian was this. Yes, when we give our life to Christ, the battle, is, the, the victory is won, excuse me. The victory is won. Jesus has overcome death. So I've gone from battling for eternity and my eternity because I've given my life to Jesus and he's already won that victory. Now all of a sudden I just step into a different battlefield. And now I get to point others to eternity and fight that battle the rest of my life. So now all of a sudden in my life, I want you to know, and I want you to know in your life, we've got to go through some agony if we want to stand strong. Because this is what Paul says in Philippians 1 verse 29. For it has been granted, granted to you on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him, but what? To also suffer. 
Man, if I knew that was part of the deal when I gave my life to Jesus, I don't know. I'd have had to think about it. How about you? I would have been like, all right, here we go. Let's renegotiate, counter offer. Let's see what we got. Can I propose a counter? Like, none of the pain and suffering, but all the peace and joy. Can we make that happen? And a little bit of blessing sprinkled on top, right? Like, something like that. Maybe four of the five lotto numbers, Jesus. Whatever that looks like. Would you ever, you want to negotiate that, right? But it doesn't, we are called to suffer for him. And so you say, what a doom and gloom message, Tyler. So here are three things I want to tell you. This isn't going to be on the screen, but if you're taking notes, you can do this. Three things that suffering does for each and every one of us. This is just what I've been learning. So maybe, maybe Jesus is teaching you something else, and if he is, share that with me. What is suffering teaching you about Jesus Christ? Number one, suffering produces patience. Suffering produces patience. Man, oh man. Patience. You know, I, when I grew up in church, I was always told, don't pray for patience because it'll be like Job, right? Like, and that, that's just a terrible example. Job was blessed better in that last part of his life than the first part, so I'll take Job all day long. Go for it because he's a J-O-B job. Praise God. Amen. I'll take a job all day long, right? But it'll produce patience in you. Paul writes in another later how that patience grows our hope. Patience is our perseverance, and that only happens through suffering. It grows our faith. You know, uh, I got to share well, another pastor story. I, I heard this story from my pastor growing up. There was a youth pastor who went to an old pastor and said this. He said, Pastor, I'm doing so great. Jesus is growing me so much. If there's one thing, though, that I could ask you to pray for, it's for patience. It's for patience. And the old pastor looked at him and said, I can do that, man. Let's go ahead and bow our head to pray. And he said, Dear Jesus, give this man so much trial and tribulation. Let him go bankrupt, lose all of his possessions. Let everyone he loves leave him because he needs to have patience. And the youth pastor said, whoa, whoa, time out, time out. I didn't pray for all that. What are you talking about? And he said, that's what patience is going to do for you. You've got to walk through suffering. It's a process. You've got to walk through suffering. And I know that's hard. And I know that stinks sometimes when we think about it. But so many times we have to suffer a little bit of pain to have some long-term progress. So number one, suffering produces patience. Number two, suffering makes you long for heaven. Man, oh, man, I could tell you, whew. Coming out, coming out of these things, I, I'm using surgery because that's the freshest in my life. But so many times when you've walked through suffering, you realize the things of this earth will never satisfy. It makes you long for heaven. It doesn't mean that I want to go. I'm not ready to go. I know Jesus has much more work to do in me or else I wouldn't be here right now. But it makes me long for heaven. It makes me long for the times to see the people I haven't gotten to see in a long time in my life. I'm going to see them on the other side. I'm going to see those things, those, those, those comforts. I'm going to get to see Jesus face to face. I'm going to get to ask him why this happened in my life. And he'll play the replay and he'll be like, well, Tyler, you were an idiot there. And you were an idiot. But don't worry, I still love you. Like you were an idiot there, there, and there. And uh, I'm sure that's going to be the highlight reel. And I can't wait because I know we're going to have a laugh about it. But I want you to know that suffering will make you long for heaven and how better to be a better citizen of heaven and to show the world the best of heaven than to be longing for it. To be longing for it. The third thing that it will do is suffering will make you sensitive to other Christians who are suffering. Basically around the world. Uh, You know, it's no coincidence. I got to go somewhere a couple weeks ago and and I'm hoping I get to go back again. But it's people that growing up in my life, I would have been told I was a heretic for hanging out. People that don't know Jesus. But I, I see that Jesus' examples was he always ate with the sinners and the tax collectors. And if I want to be accused of anything, I would love to be accused of being like Jesus and pointing people to him that need him, that need to hear about him. And so when I think about the sensitivity to the other Christians around the world, a statistic that was shared with, with me here recently is this. Since 2003, when we entered the Iraq war, there was 1.5 million Christians in Iraq. Right now, the estimate is there's less than 200,000, excuse me. Some even say less than 100,000 Christian population. They've been killed. They've been sent out. They can't find them. That's a tough pill to swallow when I get to stand in a free country. And I can talk about Jesus all day long. And I can talk about living with Jesus all day long. And I can open with my windows open. I can pray all day long with my windows open. But there are people around the world, they can't. And so when I go through suffering, I realize how little my suffering is compared to those around me that are walking through so much more. I'm exactly where Jesus made me to be, and those folks are exactly where Jesus created them to be. But I want you to know your suffering, your suffering has a purpose.
When I think of suffering, I think of it this way, and this, this might be something that you can click with. Have you ever just seen a kernel of popcorn? You ever seen just like one kernel of popcorn, right? It's not hard. You tried to eat it? Like the ones without front teeth, you know, you tried to eat it or you missed some teeth in the back because you tried to eat that kernel by itself. It's not that good by itself, is it? There's something about it that doesn't satisfy. But yet the thing about a popcorn is the thing that suffering will do in our life. When it's applied with intense pressure and intense heat, all of a sudden that popcorn kernel explodes out. And when it explodes out, I'm pretty sure most people like popcorn, right? It's something enjoyable. It's something that you want to share. And so when you walk through suffering in your life, that's what Jesus is doing to you. That hard exterior you like to build, like you've got it all together. And this little house of cards that you build, that you, you've got it held together and it's okay. I want to tell you, it's not palatable to those around you because it's not the truth. But when you go through suffering, you explode out like that popcorn kernel and you get to, I'm going to say it's buttered because you like butter. And you probably got Reese pieces all in there. Whatever it is you like to drink out of there or put in there. And, and you got the red vines and the Dr. Pepper as your straw. Whatever that looks like in your life. Wherever you are in that, I want to tell you it's like that. In your life, I want you to look at suffering from now on like some popcorn. And when I get through and I pop and the best part of me explodes out, I get to share it with the world. And that's how I love God, love others. That's how I stand strong. That's how I live a life of consistency. That's how I live a life of bravery. And even in my agony, I know it's going to produce something that's pretty dang good. So today, Christian, are you willing to stand strong? Because we know this story, maybe, once again, like I said, if you didn't grow up in church, what ends up happening is Daniel's in the lion's den. And what ends up happening is the king goes down and, and he, he goes and he rolls the stone away and he sees Daniel in there, you know, petting the kitties. And he like, he's like, you know, Daniel's like, their litter needs to be changed. Like, you know, they got to go to the bathroom. <laughs> they need some tidy cat. You know, they need some plump litter. He's fine, untouched, unscathed. And verse 22 says it this way, my God sent his angel and he shut the mouths of, li- of the lions. They have not hurt me because I was found innocent in his sight. Nor have I ever done any wrong before you, your majesty. The king was overjoyed and gave orders to lift Daniel out of the den. And when Daniel was lifted out of the den, no wound was found on him because he had trusted in his God. How I want to end about this suffering is this. Make sure your suffering is for a purpose and for the right purpose. I know the the fad sometimes is to be fasting for the point of fasting. That doesn't do anybody any good because when we're hungry, we get angry. I'm going to be real with you. I don't know who you are, but when I'm hungry, I'm angry, as you can tell, right? But don't just be fasting just to be fasting fast because that's what God's called you to do. When you suffer, Jesus is looking for people who are willing to suffer for the right reason. So many times in our life, we want to suffer just to say we suffered to go ahead and add that notch in our belt. And that's not what he wants. He wants that suffering in you so that that way you can be that popcorn that's the best it can possibly be. I'll put it to you this way. When I walk through suffering, it gives me a sharpshooter opportunity to share the gospel. Jesus doesn't need me to be a machine gun gospel sharer. I don't need to stand on the street corner and tell everybody they're going to hell. That's not what he's called me to be. And if he's called you to do that, praise God, keep doing that. That's not what he's called me to be. I just want to go watch some WWE. I'm not going to hell for seeing people watch the wrestle in front of me, right? Like, I just want to go to the concert, okay? I don't need you on the street corner telling me I'm going to hell for it, all right? It's okay. I've already given my life to Jesus. This concert's not going to change that. So if that's what he's called you to do, that's the machine gun gospel, awesome. He's not called me to do that. In my suffering, I see every time that there's a sharpshooter opportunity that presents itself for me to show Jesus like never before. Like the one I just walked through a few weeks ago and I'm about to step in here in a few minutes. Never would have had that opportunity if I didn't have to walk through a little bit of suffering, through a little bit of pain, through a little bit of inconvenience, through a little bit of something I didn't plan for, I didn't realize was going to be something I needed. But throughout, without that suffering, I wouldn't be able to do that. So I want you to know, not only are you going to get to be popcorn, you're going to get to share it at just the right time. Have you ever just had popcorn at just the right time? I'm not talking about the three-hour movie that you got to pee the whole time. I'm talking about like it's just the right time for popcorn. Like, you got home, you popped it, and the rain just started coming out at the right time, right? Like, it just did. That's what your suffering is for. And it's that deep generosity. So I look at Daniel. He shared his story. He had been exiled in his 20s. He ate only kosher's food. He told those kings when their reign would end by interpreting their dream. He saw his friends endure a fiery furnace, and yet he still was placed in authority over the entire kingdom. 
even when he was thrown to the camels, when he was thrown to the lions. You know, if I was Daniel, it would have been easy, easiest to say, man, you want to believe God's going to come through? Those are some good times. I can stand strong on the outside of this. It's only 30 days I don't have to pray. I mean, it's only 30 days. I mean, I can fast from prayer for 30 days, right, God? Like, you're not going to be mad at me, are you? Start bargaining. Maybe today that's where you stand. You've been bargaining with God. I want to tell you, it's not anything to bargain with. Just trust him that he is what he says he is. If you're a Christian, stand strong in your faith. Because here's the thing. No matter what battles you face, Paul says it. We all say it. We're called to be soldiers. We are saints first. We serve those around us hard. We love God. We love others. But we've got to understand that we're called to be soldiers. As I'm wrapping up today, if you're really struggling with standing strong, I looked for one. I couldn't find one. So you're going to laugh at this. So prepare because you know how I roll. I didn't have them yet. Uh, did anybody growing up have those little weighted punching bags? Like, no matter how hard you hit that darn thing, it never went down. And I wasn't a skinny kid, and I would try to tackle it, and it still wouldn't bust. And then eventually it would. But still, like, that darn thing would not stay down. And, I mean, didn't you just have that determination? I'm going to knock this thing down. I'm gonna, it's going to stay down this time. I know it is. I'm going to show it who's boss. And every time it was like, It just, it just kept popping back up. And so here's the thing that I want to tell you in our walk with Christ. That's what he's created us to be. No matter how much the opposing force hits us and knocks us down. You want to throw me in jail for my religion? Go ahead and do it because I'm going to stand back up. That's what Paul did. In Philippians, that's what he's saying. Hey, you want me to stand strong? You want me to fight? I'm going to do it. You can bring all the opposition you want against me. Daniel said the same thing. Hey, maybe you don't want me to eat the red meat that's kosher. That's okay. I'm going to stand back up. Maybe you want to throw my friends in the fire because of what we believe because we won't bow down for you that's fine I'm going to stand back up strong maybe you want to throw me into the lion's den guess what I'm still standing like the Elton John song I, I'm still standing I'm standing strong I'm not going to fight I'm not going to have to fight you the battle has been won yes the war has been won but understand I'm going to stand strong and if I don't stand strong I'm going into heaven so what have I got to lose church that's what we're called to do we may want to believe we may want to believe that we can't stand strong today, but I want to encourage you and tell you that you can. You can. Maybe today you've walked in and you feel like you're in the mouth of the lion's den. That opposition's come to you. Don't be discouraged. God's with you. And I can't promise you that's going to be perfect. I can't promise you that that night in that lion's den is going to be great, but I can promise you on the other side you're going to leave it better than that's exactly where Daniel was. And so today, Christians, I just want us to be reminded how we can stand strong today, how we can be that punching bag, how we can be good as it pops, praise Jesus, and amen as it pops, how we can be there, how we can be who he's created us to be, how we can be a delight, how we can be a pleasing aroma to the world by pointing them to Jesus. But here's the thing. We've got to have Jesus in our life to do that. Because here's what happened. All of us, born in that lion's den, deserving death for our sin. No matter what, all of us were born into that lion's den, and we needed someone to rescue us. We needed someone to reach down and pull us out, and we could fight our way out. We could try to love on the kitties to get our way out. We could try to do everything we could, but there was no way out unless someone brought us out of the pit, and God loved us enough, and he said, hey, you may face some lions in this world, but I'm going to send a greater lion, and it's my son, Jesus Christ, the Lion of Judah. And I want to tell you today that he sent his son down to this earth to live the life we couldn't live, die the death we deserve on the cross, and love us enough not to stay dead, but rise again on the third day. He is our way out of the pit. We can't construct a ladder to get out of it. We can't do anything because here's the thing. That stone over that pit was sealed so that our circumstance would but because of God's great grace, he sent his son down to go into that cave. And then another stone was rolled away. And that stone has already been rolled away and it stayed rolled away because there's an empty tomb there right now. Because Jesus is showing us that he loves us, that he is our rescuer, that we can try to stand strong all day long. But without him, it's meaningless. And so today, I've talked a lot about following Jesus and how we can stand strong. Maybe today you've never made that decision to follow Jesus. And I want to open the door for the opportunity for you to do 
that today. So with every head bow and every eye closed, this is what we do every week here at the Vine Church. We do this to point all of us to Jesus. Whether we followed him for two years, 20 years, 100 years, wherever that is, we know that Jesus is at the center of all we do. And so what we're about to do is say a prayer together as a family. Nobody prays alone in this house. And we're doing that for the benefit of those who are coming to faith for the first time. We're doing that for the benefit of those who are stuck in the pit and looking for a rescuer. And so today, it's not the words of this prayer that gets you saved. It's the faith that Jesus is who he says he is. And so, would everyone please repeat after me, Dear Jesus, I believe I'm a sinner separated from you. I believe you came and lived the life I couldn't live. Now the death I deserved on the cross, but love me enough not to stay dead, but rose again so that I may have life. Come take over my life, Lord. Teach me to follow you step by step the rest of my life the best way I know how. With every head bow and every eye closed, if you're watching online or you're in this house today, I'm going to ask you to respond. I'm going to count to three, and I'm going to ask you to raise your hand if it's for the first time you've given your life to Jesus Christ. One, two, three. If that's you right now, I'm going to ask you to respond. We have people, their act of worship is to help you step by step as you walk in this brand new journey, as you walk through this opposition that's going against you. We have people who want to celebrate with you. So maybe you're watching in the middle of the week, or maybe you're listening on podcasts. Reach out to us at 864-580-6698 or at hello at thevine.tv and we want to celebrate with you. And for everyone else that's in the house right now, I'm about to pray. And let us stand strong in worship right here. Let us, when we say these words and we want to have faith, let us stand in the faith that Jesus is who he says he is. And let us be the fresh air that this world needs to see that there is a hope that's greater than empty words and false promises. And so we worship and believe in the same. So, dear Jesus, thank you for this time. Thank you for this opportunity to uh, just walk with you and for us to follow you step by step. Please, in this moment, remind us of the faith that you've given us. Remind us that we can stand strong in you, and no matter our circumstance, that we, we will not be overtaken because you have already won the victory. We love you, Lord. It's in your name we pray.
trust what you say that you're good and your love is great yeah. broken inside close, we always pray this way. Uh, go ahead and let's lock up arms together and let's pray. And uh, I'm just praying for strength for us to stand strong. Jesus has given us the strength to stand. I know it's a hard thing to do. And, and, and what we shared about today is, is it can be sometimes overwhelming. It can sometimes be tough, but I'm telling you, we're going to leave that lion's den better than how we walked in. If we've given our life to Jesus, we already know where we're spending eternity and if we haven't given our life to Jesus, there's still an opportunity. Don't let today go by without talking to someone about that. So with every head bowed and every eye closed, let's pray. Jesus, thank you for this time together. Thank you for allowing us to come to your house. Uh, thank you for the gifts that you've given us that we can give back to you as an act of worship. And Jesus, right now, I would be crazy to say that some of us aren't actually walking through probably immense agony where we need bravery, where we need to have consistency with you. And Jesus, I pray that as this opposition comes against us today, that we wouldn't be afraid to see the opposition, that, that it's about more than this opposition coming against us. It's about us being who you created us to be. And we can only do that if we have you at the center of our life, if you are at the center of our will. So Jesus, I pray today that we would actually have the strength to humble ourselves in prayer to you and say, Jesus, where would you have us go? Jesus, what would you have me to do today? Jesus, I know that this may sound crazy and I know that this seems hard and I know that this circumstance I'm walking through, I just can't see, can't see you moving in it. Jesus, show me how you're gonna move through it. Show me the way that you want me to go through this. And Jesus, give us the faith to stand strong. Today, as you put people in our path that are just going through trying circumstances, let us be like that popcorn. Let us talk about our suffering with them and let us not be afraid to share you with them and share, share your love with them. And Jesus, remind us to stand strong like that punching bag. It just keeps popping back up. It won't go down because it knows what is rooted in. It knows what is weighted in. And so Jesus, thank you that we get to be here. Jesus, thank you that you keep bringing us back here. Jesus, thank you that we get to live this life and do this for your name and your glory as you. We love you, Lord. Amen. Come back with us next week as we celebrate Memorial Day. It's already that time. And we're going to talk about standing together with each other. Have an awesome week.